into our Q&A. Since we have a lot to cover tonight, a lot of questions I got. I want to start on time. I guess they'll join when they join. So let's, uh, let's pray and we will get started. So, uh, Father, thank you for uh, this day and opportunity that we have uh, to again uh, be with you and be called together as your people, as you are God and a Father and a Pastor. We ask you to continue to help guide, direct, and teach us to hear your voice and to understand the things you want us to understand and these questions we have discerning the information and understanding of your word. Help us, guide us again, and encourage us. Provide all the needs that we have in mind, body, soul, and spirit. And we ask continual uh, blessings and thankfulness for all that you have given to remind us of that and give us perspective, understanding of all the things we go through in your hand in our life. So we thank you now, Father, and be with each and every one in your ministry, your congregation, to encourage, bless, and uh, just lift up and uh, just let them know that your presence is there with each and one of us. So, Father, may the words of my mouth and the of my heart be acceptable in your sight. We ask that you now be our teacher, our guide, our shepherd, our pastor, our teacher. We pray this in Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. So, today is our first day back from our time away, and this is our Q&A. And we have quite a bit of questions. Uh, we have two from Kelly. Uh, we have two from Vicki. Uh, one of, well, actually, well, a couple from Vicki. Uh, we have five from Pam. And so, there, there's quite a bit. So I want to start with Kelly because usually I do it in order how I receive them. I did receive one from Kelly first and then one from her later, but I put her together. And then after that, I did receive Pam's, but Vicki's question leads into Pam's question. I'm going to do Vicki's first, even though I got her question later, because I think the flow of that would look better. And then we're going to, so we're going to do Kelly's and then Vicki's and then Pam's questions tonight. Yes? Uh, Lainey said, um Yesterday was 101 degrees, and today it is 59. Fickle weather feels good. Yeah, no joke, right? <laughs> so, uh, again, thank you guys also for giving us the time away to always recharge, recover, spend time with family. As we all know, we need that. So, as we will uh, engage tonight uh, again uh, on Sister Kelly's uh, two questions, uh, she asked the question of the type of Philip in the book of Acts. And she's referring to the book of Acts where not Philip the Apostle, but the Evangelist, as we know from later on the book of Acts, chapter 21, verse 8, he tells us that, uh, that he's the Evangelist, not the Apostle. But if you want to go back to the book of Acts, chapter 8, the answer to the question is, what does he represent in type? Uh, he represents in type the second half of tribulation, from which the soon Medicoi folks, who are referenced in Revelation 9, 4, as well as in Revelation 14, 1 to 5, they're the ones who have a seal, uh, and they will also have a protection from God that they, they cannot be harmed. And so they will be the ones that will be waiting for him on Mount Zion when he comes back. Uh, and for those who say to me, oh my goodness, how can you say that the ones with the seal are soon medical and not the 144,000 Jews? Because 144,000 Jews are clearly the ones who were sealed in Revelation 7, 1 to 4, and onward in 2 verse 8. It tells you that. That's because there's two groups of people being sealed. There are Jewish people sealed in Petra during the second half of tribulation, and there are also Sumeticoi people defined as those who are given a maturity in the spirit of Christ to understand the depths and mysteries and secrets of God's word. They are then, as you will, deputized. Uh, Mark 4, 13, he mentions there is a, uh, a watch. Uh, Mark 13, 34, a watchman or a porter at the door keeping watch. And that is that chief Sumeticoi who Philip represents, uh, like and done to what we saw with Elijah. And Elisha, uh, there is a, uh, again, similarity here with him being caught up as well in this typology of Semitikoi coming into view, uh, showing that they're going to be able to be moved around during the time in which there's going to be not ability to traverse normally with demonic presence and the darkness of the world around them. Uh, they're going to be moved by God around pretty freely to communicate to those that are needed to hear uh, the truth and love of God's word. So that's what Philip represents. And again, uh, for those who might say, well, how do you know again in Revelation 14? that the 144,000 there are not the same as the Jewish people in Revelation 7. It's because in Revelation 14, in verse 1, they have the name of the Son, His name, and the name of the Father on them. The Jews in Petra do not know who Jesus is as the Messiah, their, their Savior, until after He comes back from tribulation. And they look on whom they appear and say, where did you get those wounds? And He says, in the house of my friends. So the timeline would not allow for them to have the Son's name on them during this time. 
they will have that after that time. So the fact that they have his name on it and the Father in Revelation 14, 1, that demarks the second group, as well as the fact that in Revelation 7, 1 to 4, there's a mentioning of a ceiling among 144,000, 12,000 from 12 tribes. Whereas in Revelation 9, there's another mentioning of ceiling when it comes to the earth being attacked and those who would not be injured. There's no need to mention 144,000 being injured because they're already protected in Petra. Because it's talking about the other group. There's two groups. So, hope that helps make some sense of that. Um, and, and for those who run through, so I'm wondering if it's been a while since we referenced, what if we get this mentioning of Sumeticoi? That's in, I put it on the board for you. That's Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. So the question then becomes, again, why did Philip need to baptize the Ethiopian eunuch and then to be trans, transversed or snatched away, as it says, in, in verse 38, I believe it is, yeah, verse 38 of Acts chapter 8. Why does he have to baptize the Ethiopian eunuch first before that happens to typify the Semitic one? Because that's the, the function of the Semitic one is to make disciples. Remember when Jesus said that, he said, make disciples, baptizing them. And so baptism comes after one has a decision who already believes to then follow, to study, to become a student of, to become more diligent to live for Christ. That's the problem with those in the tribulation period that are in Christ. They have mailed it in. They have think uh, that they've got it all down. And, 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 and you no, know, they're going to go to heaven when they die. It's all good to go. Well, you reap it yourself. You didn't sow a time with Christ here in fellowship and relationship to cultivate. You're going to reap what you sow. And so therefore... You need to wake up to that reality that belief does get you to heaven at one point, but not to stay there, unfortunately. So the same medical are those who are going to try to help you to have some kind of entrance or inheritance into his kingdom to come, and that's what they're there to do. So the word baptism is a preclude to the fact that the reason you're getting baptized is because you've already committed to wanting to be a disciple. So that means you're already a believer. So being a believer is already in view, hence the story of the European eunuch. And then he said, where's the water? Why shouldn't I be baptized? And Philip was showing that because they were showing the demarcation of getting people to not just be believers for those who need to have that happen to them, but also to denote his real function is to also equip and teach those who do believe how to live to, in a way of obedience to Christ. And then after he did that, then he happens to be traversed onward. And before this, we see in chapter uh, Acts chapter 8, you see in verse 1, he says that, that Saul was the one persecuting people in verse 1, and then in verse 2, there's lamentation that Stephen had the men over him being killed. And then you have again, then you have Philip mentioned in, in, in verse uh, 5. So Philip is being mentioned in the, in the context of the Apostle Paul, who had not yet been converted. He's Saul at this time, the persecuting malicious one who's going out there and murdering folk for two years plus. He's very much on a rampage. So Philip's existence of being mentioned, don't forget, is during a time of great persecution. Great death and carnage. We're talking about 11 years after the resurrection of Christ. So it's post good times roll. You know, the, the good times of the apostles when they were first, you know, on their high, on their heyday. It, it wasn't just them elated from Pentecost. We're talking, we're 11 years after Pentecost now. And, and it's, the, the, the masses are growing, not just to believe, but who is growing in understanding and growing in the knowledge of Christ. And so God is using Philip to again, uh, earmark that same similitude that it's not about just believers coming to know Christ, it's about those who are believers coming to realize it's more important to follow than just believe and sit back and do as little as possible. It's time to apply what you know and put forth some effort and realize there's an inheritance that can be gained or lost. Stop resting on your salvation that you have in Christ and know that it's not enough to have God's fullest blessings and benefits. It is enough to have Christ forgive you and be forgiven of your sin. Absolutely. But it's not enough so therefore, because of that, gains God, gain God's full blessings and benefits of his inheritance, which is a blessing and benefit of cultivating and developing a relationship with him. So Philip represents a person to wake you up to that. I did the Ethiopian unit, which is why, again, the comment from him was that he was so awake to the fact of growing. That's why he makes the comment, you know, there's water, why should I be baptized? Meaning the common sense understanding of once I believe, now that you've taught me, why wouldn't I want to learn more? Why wouldn't I want to do more? Let's do that. And so that's what his job function was, that of the same medical, is to wake people up who don't know who Jesus is, wake people up who know who he is but aren't living right. Either way, they're being woken up. Okay? And so, but the focus is on the latter, those who know him to start doing right and living right and being right with God. Hence, like the morning scripture I gave today. So hopefully that answers the question satisfactorily. I have this on the board uh, written down already, so Kelly's not online to say that's okay. 
as I normally do, I'd say that they answer the question satisfactually, and the person would say yes, but you probably can't do that. So I hope when the playback is done, hope that it's answered satisfactorily. So number two question from Kelly, which is way more involved, if that one didn't seem like it was involved. Uh, I, I tend to have a lot of wordy answers, as we all know. Then we have question number two from Kelly, which is great. Both these, all these questions are like really like, wow. Um, not that they're not ever that way, but these are more like, I mean, I don't know, they're just, maybe it's because we were off and we were relaxed, and now I come back to like, whoa, pretty loaded questions. Um, the other question Kelly asks is Romans 7. Um, she goes, hey man, you know, what's the difference between like law and, co and commandment? The, the mention, Paul mentions law and commandment quite a bit. And, and talking about he's condemned by either one, and, and it's like, I, I, what's, it's confusing. Like, what's going on here? And so, a lot to be read there. So if you go to Romans 7, let's go there. As you're turning there, I will allude to the fact that the uh, answer we got to say first off to make the conflict simple, even though it's not simple to understand, um, is that the commandment and the law are referring to, Kelly's got it right, she mentioned you have to die through one and die another time to the other, that's correct. Absolutely, but, but why is that, right? So, so the law is the Mosaic law, okay? And you'll find that the word law mentions uh, often, that's almost every time in Romans 7, it's with the article in front of it, which is the law of Moses. And when the article in front of it does not there, it's referencing just the, the actual all-encompassing governmental law, laws in which how we govern ourselves amongst each other back then, the Jewish people, that is. So the Mosaic law, which is what God imparted to Moses directly, and all the things that came out of that, are included when they use the word law. But when they put the in front of it, they're referring to explicitly the, the law that directly came from God to Moses, which is all 613. Yes? Okay, um, Lenny said, I have a difficult time understanding how people can have any normal life or thinking during the tribulation. Vicki said, sorry, I'm late. I couldn't remember if it was 6 or 630. <laughs> That's okay. No, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, to reach your point, Sister Laney, I, I have a difficult time referring to anybody having um, any kind of normalcy in Revelation, a uh, passage where the tribulation gets to be the wrath of God, it uh, gets unleashed, and, and yeah, it's not fun. Um, the first half I can see some normalcies of life uh, transpiring. I can see that totally because the Antichrist is the white horse and the red horse. He's more docile, covert, operative. He's not overtly being satanic and overtly being evil. He's doing some of what we're seeing now. Uh, they are going to say that scriptural talk and biblical talk, Jesus talk is hate speech. They're going to, you know, collect all Bibles and burn them, shut down websites of Christianity, stuff, stuff like that. Sure, that would be happening, but that's that's not really that far off what we see today and some of the similitudes of churches being attacked, you know. So, there's going to be some of that going on, but it gets really intensely insane in the last three and a half years, which remember in Revelation 8, God said he will have a third of the day and a third of the night cut, uh, and then he mentioned that over back in um, Matthew 24, that the days are cut short for the sake, because he takes eight hours from the day and eight hours from the night, leaving you with, you know, or excuse me, four hours from the day, four hours from the night, leaving you with eight hours less in the full entire day. So the 24-hour days go to 16-hour days. Remember that? Because if not, not even people that were in Christ could, could survive it. Even the soon medical, who are blessed by God not to be killed, the psychology of it all, the emotional pain of it all is just too much to bear for anyone. No matter if you're protected or not, you're still even being in sin, and he's got to cut that short. That's how horrible, to your point, it's going to be. And of course, Luke 21 mentioned people will even die and faint of just stress and anxiety. It's all the different horrors. Yes? Okay. Uh, a couple of things. Um, Laney said, even in the first part, when the waves are completed, I guess when they are not in touch with the Lord and believers in the faith, then it may not impact them. Yeah, the first wave. Yeah, <laughs> Vicky remember. said, which question are we on? We're just on Kelly's first question. We finished. Now we're on Kelly's second question. And we're going to cover your questions next, Vicky. Um, and then we're going to cover Pam's questions last, because your questions make you lead into Pam's questions. So, yeah, and remember, Sister Lane, too, that the wave one that happens prior to the tribulation period is going to be so small that it won't even be um, that recognizably um, meaningful to people. And by the time the second and third one, which are larger, take place, uh, remember, you're talking a matter of a couple months before the beast unleashes himself, and you're not going to have much of the time to really recollect and react to that at all. It's going to be by the time you realize 
it's a thing. You've already got your attention focused on the fact that Satan himself is now incarnated as the beast, and that's a whole different issue to be concerned about. So the rage, how God did, is God's going to do, is going to pretty much veil them to be non-relevant to people. The first one, because it's going to be small in number. The second two, wave two and three, which happened right prior to and right at, right during the midpoint, which basically, it, 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 <laughs> you don't have much time to really recollect and gather in the data of what's happening because it's going to happen within just a couple of months. You go from Manny Christ to being slain, he comes up with a beast, and it's, it's, it's all, it's getting on at that point. It's demonic influence, dark days, very ugly, really quick. So, yeah, remember that. So, anyway, so as we go through uh, Sister uh, Kelly's second question about the book of Romans in chapter 7, uh, her question was about, um, again, the, the words law and commandment and how they're different. So the law is the law of Moses, a Mosaic law. And remember the Mosaic Law, and have it on the board already for you, that Mosaic Law, according to Galatians 3, 21 to 25, is our pedagogue. It is to lead us. It's our tutor to, to guide us to Christ. And he, he, like any tutor, once you have been uh, helped to learn the lesson, you no longer need the tutor. You're done. Christ fulfilled the law. All of it. Not some of it. All of it. Paul even mentions in Romans 7, the law is spiritual. Because it's intended not to be a letter of the law, as Jesus said about the Pharisees, Sanhedrin, Sadducee kind of folk. It's about the spirit and intent of the law, which meant it was the character of God being displayed before men as a mirror to show us how disgusting we are. We can't do all these things. Encapsulated by our Catholic friends, thinking there's only ten. There's more than ten, but that's a pretty good um, you know, uh, bullet point of everything that hangs on the fact of God's character we can never live up to. So that's the reason why Paul says what I want to do, I don't do. Yeah, I want to fulfill the law. I've known that law as a Jew all my life, but I can't live up to that. That's the character of Almighty God. No one can live up to that. I can't do it. I just can't do it. But then he says a commandment. Well, the commandment is what Jesus said in John 15, 12. He said, this new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. Well, wait a minute. Jesus loved us with agape love. Can we do that? That's a big fat no. I wish I could love you the way Jesus loves me and loves you. I just can't do that. I can't love anybody like that. I wish I could. I just can't. Because I'm a sinner and I'm depraved and I'm, fi and I'm, and I'm finite. He's infinite and he's perfect and holy and he's God. So <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> that's what he meant when he said that in John 15, 12. Then he goes to John 21, 15 and 17 and expounds more when he talks about Peter saying, do you agape me? Do you agape me? Okay, do you phileo me? Remember that? That's the commandment. He's on it. So that's why Paul's going, even with the, the, the law, which was in the Mosaic law, which is pedagogue, leaving to Christ, I was, I was just condemned. I, I could never live up to it. I, 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 was, I would try, and I, I'm like that old Greek mythology, rolling the rock up the hill, and it gets on falling back on me. I can't get over the hill. Then Christ comes around like, yes, he fulfilled the law. Yes, I'm free from the, the, the sin and death, and the, the law has been done away with by Christ. Yes. Christ gave me a commandment of doing what now? love others like he loved me i can't do that either come on so he's like i can't do it. whether i was under the pedagogue of the law of moses which showed me the character of god and condemned me where i stand or whether i'm under the commandment of christ that says love like he loved me i i i, I got no shot i got no shot either one of those things he's like either way i go whether i'm in the law of moses in the house of moses in the house of christ in christ of covenant and testament either way God shows me out of the blood or under the blood. Either way, whether you're saved by grace through faith or just of covenant. Either way, you, we, I, we all need God to help us to get to the next step of living righteously. No one can do it on their own, even when you're in Christ. That's what are you saying? Don't act like you're in Christ, although all of a sudden everything's good. That's not how it works. <laughs> There's work to be done, and he's got to do it. So he's mentioning how it's the spirit of Christ that has to do that. It's the spirit in us, the Holy Spirit, to renovate us, to make that room to... Give us that agathos disposition so that God, Christ, the Spirit of Christ, and then we work with the Holy Spirit to then, out of that, take the catalyst fruits that come out of that and, and, and help us live mature lives. And, and that's what he's talking about. That's what he says. I, I just can't. No matter where I go, whether, whether I was uh, whether I was Saul and persecuting people, thinking I was upholding the law of Moses, well, I got that wrong by a, by, a, by a wide margin. But I was doing the right thing. But I was persecuting those who called themselves worshipers of God and that they were doing a false God. I was, I was telling them, like God said, to do that with the pagans, take them out, so I was taking them out. And I got that way wrong, and Jesus said, I'm him whom you persecute. Okay, so I, I got him in my life because he made it all possible, and, and then he tells me to love like he loves. I, I can't do that. I got people in Corinth bugging me to no end for years, telling me I'm not an apostle. 
It, it gets on my nerves. I'm asking God to take the phone away from me. I'm going to slap him in the face. But I can't do that. I took their mom, their dad, their wife, their kids, you know, burned their houses. So now he's got to pay the price. And so the reality is that Paul's saying, you know, look, whether it's the law I got to follow, whether it's the commandment, I got to die to both of those things. I got to die to the law of Moses, knowing I cannot fulfill what I've been asked to do. Only God has given me the ability to do that when I'm out covenant. When the Holy Spirit helps me to come upon me to do that back in the day. Now I'm in Christ, that Holy Spirit living in me. Even then, I can't do what Christ told me to do in loving like he loved. I can't do it. It doesn't matter if I know what he said and I have the Holy Spirit in me. He still has to do it. I can't do that. I can't. People all the time irritate me, aggravate me. I'm sure they do you too. Folks that just, you know, rub you the wrong way because they just mock God, disrespect you, those you love. Things about God that you respect, they don't respect. It's not nice. We are living in a very unkind world. And so Jesus said, yeah, but they treated me unkind. They hated me first, right? Yeah, that's okay. So now, of course, in Romans 7, the issue is, it, just give you a couple examples. I don't want to be too overreaching and just block doing this, but to get specific uh, to Romans 7, which Kelly pointed out, we have a couple verses in Romans 7, verse 1. Are you ignorant, brethren, if I am speaking of those who are acquainted with law, that the, the law controls a man for as long as the time as he lives? Hence the women, the married woman, is bound by the law to the living husband. So he says, bound by law. But if, if the husband dies, she is released from the law of the husband. So then while the husband is living, the, the, that she will be declared an adulteress if she belongs to another man. And if the husband dies, she is free from the law that she is not an adulteress though she belongs to another man. Referring to the fact that as long as he's alive, in other words, that's how the law cannot be. The law cannot be adhered to when you're in testament because if you are trying to do that, then you are, you are in, in effect, being an adulteress because you're cheating on Christ. You're trying to say that his commandment is equal to the law of Moses. And it's not. It's greater than. Are you out to mind? He even said so. What's the greatest commandment? And they said, love, your, love the Lord God, your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And, and Jesus said, on these all the law, the Psalms, and the prophets rest. So, so much of the law of Moses being equal, it's subordinate to the law of Christ, the commandment of Christ, excuse me, to love others as he loved us. So when you start acting like, hey, I'm going I'm to keep alive the law, and I'm going to obey it, I'm going to be a good little Jewish messianic person. But you're being a doofus. I'm sorry, but you're being ignorant. It's like a person who leaves their husband and, and, and says, look, I'm going to go out, and you just can't do that. you got to go by the rules. You know, there's rules about divorce. That's what he's talking about. So you, you, you're bound. He's talking about people just step out any way they want. That's what he's talking about. You, you know you're bound by the law, man. There's rules. There's rules to the hen house. You want to leave the farm? You got to do it the way the rancher says. <laughs> you just can't go, I don't like here anymore. I don't like the grass. I like expect it's too much close into me. I want more space. Doesn't work that way, Jack. You see ducks and cows doing that? You see them go, quack, quack. That's not walk away. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. They can't talk to the farmer. The farmer dictates where they're going to go, where they're not going to go. When they live, when they die. Right? But you won't understand that. That's how we are. We're God's sheep in his pasture. He sets the parameters. That's what's up. I don't care if you like it or not. That's, that's, that's the deal. That's the deal. And so if you don't want to understand the deal, then you know, he's the shepherd. I'm not the shepherd. He's the shepherd. There's only one. He's a great and gentle and cheap shepherd. That's who he is. And he sets the rules for all the sheep. And we're in his fold, in his, in his pasture. There's parameters to that. You just can't leave when you want. Why do want? You can't do that. So that's what he's talking about with the law of Moses. And you go to the law of Christ. And you, you, so remember the 23rd Psalm. The shepherd's got to wake up in the morning to get that water and lap it up. That's still water off the, off the grass and the leaf. He's got to put you back in his path of righteousness that you've already formed beforehand to walk with him. So there's processes and thoughts of the commandment of loving others as Christ has loved us. We have to spend time with him to understand his spirit has to be in us, to fill us with that love so that we can have him in us, love others the way he loves us. And Paul's basically pointing out, I just can't do that. It doesn't matter how I feel about this man or this woman. Men and women will always let you down. It's called the human psyche. It's just the human condition. We're not built to always help each other. We're going to hurt each other. That's what we do. We're good at that. We're good at hurting those we love. Right? I don't know we all are. I, I don't mean to, but I know I do. I'm ignorant. I'm sorry. I'm just a sinner and he's ignorant. But God says, I know that. But and Paul's not recognizing that's what he's talking about. But understand, you're under a, a mastership of servitude to 
the law of Moses if you're a covenant, and the commandment if you're in, in Christ and the loving others as he loved you. And so either way, you, you, you can't do it, you, but you are still confounded by it to, to, to expose to you that you can't do it on your own. Yes? Vicki said, so when Jacob lay with his concubines, he was breaking God's law. Remember, remember, the law of Moses came way after that time. So when you retroactively put that in there, then yes. But remember, it was a different time then because they were the beginning of the reset. They're still in the first, say, gosh, what is that? The, the, the flood was around 3370 uh, BC. Um, Abraham was 2076. You're talking a good um, 1,500 years later, roughly, about 15, 1,200 years later. So they're 1,200 years later, or back then the generations were very long. Um, so they're about second generation in to the post nomadic flood. They were still living a long time. So the post nomadic flood kind of, it, it, Abraham's day, they started to, they started to, you know, still live, they were living over 100 years old, remember? Um, so you, you have uh, situations where you look at uh, some people live hundreds of years old. And so you have, you know, a couple of generations there from, from Abraham on, that was the first generation from Abraham on where they started to die off before 200. So you, you got to remember that for for, for Jacob and, 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 and his kids that are the grandkids of Abraham, I'm not just I'm not explaining away what they did is wrong. It is wrong. But they are the third generation of the new life cycle or the mortality rate now being cut down from 900 being a maximum around average around 600 years old. Now it's being cut down to about less than 200 years. And, and that was just three generations into that new mortality life cycle. So I'm not saying they're excused. I'm just saying, it, 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 you know, the attrition of man's sinful doofusness does take us a while to root itself out. You know, we, we got to, God gave us latitude. God didn't say it was right. It's not. But also, again, it's not like he's way far removed from it with lots of retrospect to learn from. He didn't have the law of Moses. But in retrospect, yes, he was incorrect. But to defend him, he was also in the early timeline of the post shorter mortality of mankind, third generation into the shorter mortality, now experiencing, you know, obviously clear errors in retrospect. Yes. Vicky said, then Solomon was. He, no, see, yeah, exactly right. So David and Solomon are definitively wrong. David and Solomon are definitively wrong. Jacob might give more of a pass to because he didn't have the law of Moses. Even though it's wrong, he has that in his defense. Uh, Solomon and David are more culpable because they had the law of Moses and they had a clear indication of what was right and wrong, and they didn't do it. They, they, they didn't obey the, the rules. So both of them, but don't forget, David was not, he was not a, a, a mono... You know, uh, what was it? What's I'm looking for? Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, not, gosh. Uh, Mah 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 ah! Mahogamous? Ah! The word I'm looking for. Anyways, that's okay. <laughs> I'm getting my thoughts. But he, he wasn't a one woman man. He had like five wives. So he, he was not good. He, that's why Solomon got it from him, you know? You think about it. So, and there goes Matthew Day, the man of God's own heart. Not because he lived right, because he was cut deeply when he was corrected by it, confronted by it, when he wanted to pay a restitution for it, and he paid a consequence. He knew the consequence was there, he was cut deep by it, and he wanted to make right by it immediately, whatever it is. So that's what he's an average on his heart for, not that he was righteous, because he wanted to make right by his errors of his sin, quickly and immediately with restitution and repentance, 100%. Yes? And then Vicky said, monog monogamous. Mahogamous. You said monogamous, you're funny. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to figure out, how to say it right. You're doing what I'm doing, babe. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to say it right myself. I'm having a brain fog in my brain. I know what you mean, mahogamous. No. <laughs> I can't even say it. I know what I'm trying to say, but my, my, my mouth is, it, I'm already diffused. That's okay. I'm not going to go there. And, uh, and then she uh, helped, it says, mono, monog monogamous. monogamous. That's, there you go. That's, I couldn't get it out of my she, mouth. She I knew what I was trying to. <laughs> I knew I was trying to say it. I couldn't Thank get you, it out of my mouth. Well, sometimes you know, hey, so it goes to show you, man. I'm just a sinful doofus. All right, so, um, so back in Romans seven. So the, the issue about what, what he's talking about here is, is, is again that that issue. And he, he goes over to verse five. For when we were in the flesh, those sinful passions which we were through the law worked in our members to bring forth fruit to death. Meaning again, we could say we want look because Cain brought from his works of the field and the fruit and God said no he didn't, he didn't turn favor toward him right so the fruits of the flesh are what we think we can give or, or what we think we can do and, 
as the people do today. People say things like, you know, when, when uh, the law of Moses was to show you that you just can't do anything you want in any way you want. You have to do what God says, how God says. That was the key to the law of Moses. What God says wasn't enough. How he said to do it is also important. He wasn't playing around with you. Do what he says, how he says, and when he says. Very strict. And some people were like, hey, as long as I do what God says, does it really matter when and how? A la King Saul, remember? Well, here's the uh, an Amalekite king, and here's some of the, 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 the cattle we can sacrifice. The man was like, are you deaf? God said, kill him and all the cattle. Well, you know, I want people to see the God of the king, and one cattle be sacrificed. I don't care how you want to justify it, bro. You're wrong. Did God say to kill him? Yes or no? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So why are they doing a lie for? I don't want to hear your narrative. I don't hear it. We're all trying to, we do it all the time. That's what Paul's saying. We can't help ourselves but try to take the easy way out to try to peek up just a little bit to say, look what I was a part of, which is why someone told me recently to say, boy, that's why it puffs people up when they say, I led this person to Christ. No, he didn't. That's called free will theology. That's wrong. Christ led them. The Holy Spirit led them to him. No, you didn't lead anybody to Christ. Nice try. We didn't do any of that. We were used by God as he led them to himself. That's a true statement. I didn't lead anybody. I'm used by God. Just like you. I'm, I'm a vessel. You're a pot. I'm a vase. You're a spoon. I'm a bowl. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm the saucer, you're the cup. Hey, whatever. We're just utensils in the kitchen. And the master chef is using whatever he wants. And for you to act like you actually served the meal, you actually cooked the meal, when you're just a vessel, at best you served it at best. You didn't cook it, you didn't go get it, you didn't prepare it, that's for sure. We have no culinary expertise whatsoever. We didn't always realize that. That's what Paul's talking about, is that we can't help ourselves. We, we don't want to be in a servant, servitude mindset. We always want to be more a part of something. So we start to overstep our bounds. We all know what God means when he says, have no God other gods before me but, but him. I know what he means. I will then early spend all my time talking about the Lord God. And then you, you get to an exaggerated sense. I'm going to draw, not, I'm not going to make an image of him. I'm going I'm I'm to continue to try to put a visage to him so that I can show him that he's the only God and there's no other gods before him. But you're doing the very things that I have to do. Don't put an image. What are you doing? You know, we, we do stuff like this all the time. We try to justify one thing as we're disobeying another thing. We do it all the time. We do it all the time. <laughs> we have to the Israelites to just, you know. But that's what Paul's talking about in Romans 7, that the Israelites have that problem. And then that Holy Spirit is only in them. We have Christ going in us, the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of Christ as mature ones. And he's saying, I, he definitely has that. He goes, I don't care if I do or not. doesn't change the fact I'm a sinner. It matters. I care, but don't get me wrong. It doesn't matter when it comes to the fact that I'm still a wretched man. I'm still going to try to love them the way I want to because I, I'm trying to do what I'm trying to think it through and love the way I should instead of just going to the scripture, having God fill you with his truth, and then loving them that way. He, he says, I, I, I'm catching myself trying to analyze it psychologically, which is good to some degree, but not when you just act on that information before you then don't really anchor and, and, and harness yourself to the tether of God's word. That's what should anchor you and tether you to why you're thinking why you're thinking, how you're talking how you're talking, why you're doing what you're doing, or why you're not thinking what you're thinking and doing what you're doing. That should all be anchored, tethered, weighted into the word of God. And that's what the Christ family said, love others as, as I love you. How can you do that unless you know more about how he loves? you got to spend time. Because you can't do it. He has to do it in you. He's only going to do it in you to the degree the word of God, the written word is filled in you, the living word flows out of you. And he's the one that can love like he can love. So Paul says, even I know he's the greatest wisdom of all when it comes to mysteries and secrets of a human being. And he's like, I, I, I can't do it. I can't pull it off. I just can't do it. And so Paul is mentioning again that the, the law, the law of Moses, the, this mirror that shows me I can't measure up the character of God, the commandment, the commandment of Christ loving as he loved me. I, I can't do that either, even with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ helping me. Because we, on both cases, with or without the help of God, the Holy Spirit, or God, the Spirit of Christ, I, I, I want it I overstep. I just can't help but to want to get more involved. When, I, when all that God wants is us, wants our obedience, wants us to trust him. 
Just do what he says. Stop trying to overthink it. Just do what he says. Do the hard thing. And by the way, there's an old adage that it takes a lot to have moral courage. It takes a lot to, to do the right thing and everybody around you is saying other things that make you feel intimidated or make you question why and when and how you should say something. But you got to have that moral courage to do that. More importantly, they have the spiritual fortitude to always do that when you're talking about loving others as Christ loved you. And that's why Paul, if Paul's saying he has a problem with that, don't give me this malarkey garbage that, oh, it's easy to do that. It's not. Paul's telling you it's hard. It's very difficult to always have, always have moral courage, spiritual fortitude in all situations, in every circumstance, every relationship, because people do get to you. People do irritate you. They hurt you. They pain you. They disappoint you. They frustrate you. They abuse you. Right? They break your heart. And yet Paul, and then Paul's reminded, God says, hey, I did that to him too. But he loved me. And he said, I'm supposed to love others. He loved me. I just can't do it. I'm just kidding. I keep getting condemned, whether by the law of Moses, remember from my, from my past life, remembering how that still was over me when I think back in the current state of the affairs of the commandment of Christ. I'm condemned again. I can't, I just can't live up. He's God showing you no matter where you fit in the timeline of all covenant person or in testament person, you need him intimately every day. Every day. Every day. You're just more fortunate and blessed to have Christ and the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Christ with you to do that. And that's the advantage that he's talking about we have. And that's why he ends in Romans 7 by saying, thanks to God by means of, the, of, of Jesus Christ our Lord. Consequently, then indeed, I myself by the mind, by the mind, and in subjection, subjection to the law of God, you see, the law of God, meaning the law of Moses, is the actual character of God. I'm in subjection to God's character. I'm in his slave. He's my master. And by the law of the flesh, and by the flesh, excuse me, I'm to the law of sin. He is, yeah. So my, 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 my sin is, 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 is being subjected to that law that governs over me that just wants to always break whether it's the Mosaic Law or the commandment of loving others, it doesn't matter. If it's Christ's commandment to love them, the Mosaic Law, I, I, it's okay, though. He says that my spirit, though, I've committed myself to, to always want to go back to that center, to go back to that goal of knowing what right looks like, and that is remembering that it's not about my character. I never will measure up. It's about God's character. I'm a servant to God's character, not mine, God's. I'll never measure up. I will never measure up. I'm never going to be a good man. I'm never going to be a man of integrity. People say that, but it's not relative in God's mind. None of us are going to be men and women of integrity or good in his eyes. Relative to each other, we can say that, but not to him. And Paul's mentioning that to us to remind us, all those things we say in human terms are relative to us. The death to the law means that you have to die to yourself recognizing you could never do in the works, what it takes to measure up to the character of God. You must die to that fact. Stop trying to. Then you have to say to yourself, die to the commandment of, the, of, of Christ and tell yourself, no matter how much you want to forgive and be merciful and compassionate and empathetic and long-suffering and forgiving, God's saying, you, you can't pull off agape. You, you can't do it. I don't care how good you think you are. You, you're not going to ever do it. And you have to die to that that journey that it's not obtainable. Some folks think it is. Oh, look, look, he or she went to that orphanage. He or she fed those people. He or she. And that's why we do those things, to make us think we're doing it so we can then subconsciously and or consciously justify how we're treating others like dirt, how we hold on, how we hold on to things that are against God's word, how we think things and do things and say things that are not appealing to God. That's not a God they love. Because how can the word of God be in us when we're disobeying it, only to untruth and falsehoods, because to have agape love come out of us, the living word comes out of us based on the measure of the written word in us. So, you, <laughs> so stop fighting that fight of thinking you can pull it off. You can't. Paul's just saying, just relent. Be a servant to the character of God. Stop trying to act like you can be that character of God, because you can't. You're a servitude to it. You're not the team. You belong to the team. He's the coach, he's the manager, he's the owner of the team. He's just a player. And the team is not one person man. All of us together are still being coached, managed, and owned by the same Lord God, Jesus Christ. And he's the one who's coaching us up, who's teaching us up. We can't 
do this on our own. So that's just I'm not running set a little diversion there, long answer, but hope that answers the question. Then, Sister Vicky, your questions. And Roman, oh, I'm, if Sister Kelly's on online, I usually would say to answer your questions satisfactorily. You obviously can answer. Hopefully, listening to this back, you can say yes, I hope so. Um, but it's always great to get your questions. I want to be yours first because we didn't usually get yours. And I wanted to do that first. And I did hear your, your first question was really the first one. And, and um, so I did the second one with it. So that's the Vicky's question. Actually came later than Pam, but it leads into Pam, so I'm going to do yours first, Vicky. And that's in Genesis chapter 6. So you asked the question, hey, what's going on? In Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. So let's read that. And it came to pass. When, and this is a very important thing you're talking about because it's, <laughs> it's a lot. Um, when men began to multiply, that means there was myriads of humans populating. They were having sexual union, intercourse. They were... They were propagating, propagating the earth. They were multiplying like rabbits, right? And like there's TV, you know, right? that's that's their, <laughs> that's that's their, they're having, they're having good times. They're, they're, God said, do it. They're, 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 they're getting married and they're just having relations in marriage and out of marriage. Because remember God over in Matthew says they were married and given in marriage in Noah's day. And so therefore we know they weren't just giving in, in multitudes with in marriage, they were doing this out of wedlock as well. So basically, there was a lot of sexual orgies going on. And marriages, it was great. They were having multiple kids. And folks would say, married or not, one partner or not, monogamous or not, who cares? I got one wife, two wife, three wife. I got Liz guy, I got one guy, two guy, four guy, who cares? They were just, you know, they were just wife swapping, men swapping. You could imagine what was going on. They were doing sexual and immoral things. They weren't just having monogamous relationships of multiple children. They were crossing over, swinging, if you will, as they call it, right? But what's going on here? So this sexual free-for-all is being witnessed by the angelic host in, in Genesis 1.27, the ones who replenished, the ones who fell in the first fall in Genesis 1, when the earth became a void. The ones mentioned in 2 Peter chapter 2, the ones who went to Tarsus, are the ones that fell in Genesis 1.1. Now, the second group of angels that replenished them in Genesis 1.27, the host of them were all completed, Genesis 2.1. And God rested only created and made, Genesis 2.3. Now we go to Genesis 6, 1 and 2. So what's happening is humanity was having a free-for-all of good times, some within marriage and a lot without marriage. As a matter of fact, you know it's more out of wedlock than it was in. They were more doing it immorally than we're doing it morally because... That's why God says, I only see you, Noah, that's righteous. Denoting the nature of the majority of people, the large masses are just doing whatever made them feel good, do it. Kind of like today. Yeah. Lainey said, sounds like today's attitude. Yeah. Yeah, they say hooking up. Well, they were hooking up back then quite a bit. So then, when he says, and men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born to them, meaning... The reason he says daughter is born unto them is he's highlighting, obviously, boys and girls are born, but he's highlighting the daughters because, by attrition, you're going to have boys and girls birthing. But why do you mention daughters? Because those are the ones with the eye of the angelic host in the heavens. And why would you say that's the case? Are you saying that all angels are males? No. No, angels are male and female at the beginning in Genesis 1.27. But they did have ability to procreate, not in the way we do, but in some other different way they do, because they were spirits with flesh. Jude 5 through 8 says they had a heterox flesh they went after, which means different from. We got a word heterosexual from that, which means that they have flesh to go after different flesh. They also are mirrored in Jude with that Sodom and Gomorrah. In Leviticus 17, we know Sodom and Gomorrah had men with men, women with women, women with animals, and men with animals. Ye. So the angels saw what was going on amongst the two genders and the two derivations of human and animal kingdom. And they went, interesting. I wonder if I could partake. It looks like they're having quite a good time. So God points out daughters of men because those are the ones that can give birth. They wanted to have the experimentation of giving birth. Later on in Genesis, we find the aspect of the homosexuality of men on men when they want to go after the angels that were helping out Lot. You know? So that wasn't off the table. That was still in line, but it wasn't the primary goal 
at first, the primary goal was to propagate and produce what would come forth. And where did they get that from? There's no sin that originates with an angel or a man. There's no authorship of sin that a man or angel ever said, oh, I got the idea first. No, you didn't. Every authorship of sin, every, every origination of sin, comes from you know who? Satan. So where did they get the idea from? As a celestial being to lie with a, a human. A hello, Satan and Eve. There you go. You can ignore it all you want. The facts are the facts. You can't say it just dawned on them. That's what happened. They got that from him. They know what he did. They were curious themselves. And just like he sold a bill of goods to the angels in the heavenlies to, to begin with, based on whatever he told them, he obviously had a different, you know, different leverage by saying, look, by the way, remember Cain was a first generation hybrid. Don't forget, first generation hybrids are a little different. So remember on the board, I'm going to on the board, there's something for you here so you can understand this. So a first generation hybrid, a first generation hybrid, what I mean by that is that you have, whoops, a first generation hybrid is an angel, is an angel plus a human equals, equals a hybrid. And that hybrid, because it was a first generation, they were about 20 feet to 30 feet tall, according to the Steve Quayle's document of his book. He saw looks at this. They were very, very big. Then God destroys the earth after uh, the flood of, of Noah, as far as all the living things, except for those animals that were on the ark and the eight humans. Then you have second generation hybrid. And that is a hybrid a hybrid for a hybrid no more angels have fallen now a hybrid plus a human equals another hybrid so that's a second generation hybrid they're not from the original angelic breed who did what they did and that means they're about 10 feet to 15 feet they're not as big because they're a second generation they don't come from the the actual giants themselves that were bigger so during Noah's day at this time, the giants in the land of renown, God says, of renown, God calls them mighty men. They were the first generation. They were the first gen hybrids. They were some big boys. Never dawned on you probably that Cain and Abel they weren't the same size. Cain's pretty doggone huge. Cain's like 20, 30, he's a big dude. Cain's pretty massive. Hello. He don't fit. He don't fit at all. As he grew, he's like, hello. Makes more sense too now why God would have said, he needed to go to Nod. Not only did you take your brother, which was easy picking for you. Now you see why he was more upset because of the fact that I'm going to cap out of this, this little guy. Compared to him, he's a giant. Hello, that ain't funny, right? Name him, massive, he's a giant. So it's unbelievable. So you have these people, Lamech, you know, all these people, not the Lamech of Noah, but Lamech under King's line is too lame. You have these people, Tubal King, these folks, folks were massive, they were huge. And so here you have, uh, but again, they're second generation. So King was the big one, 20, 30 foot, then he's second generation, they're about 10 to 15, remember? So King was the 20, 30 foot guy, and then everybody else was 10 to 15 because Angels weren't doing that until you had Genesis 6 come around. And then you can kind of see that's probably why. My guess is that Cain's, you know, towering over human beings began to, they saw that, hey, wait a minute, his offspring aren't as tall as him. They're now going from 20, 30 feet that he was, offspring of Satan and Eve. Now they go down to being 10, 15 feet. Like, what's going on? Because his lineage is the bad guys, but they're no longer as big. So here's Nama, 10, 15 feet, Tubal Cain, Lamech, his lineage, right? In Genesis chapter 4. So, okay. So, all right. So, well, then, then what's the deal with the fact, or is it Genesis chapter 3, actually, at the very end? So, at the very part of this, okay, when you go into that, you say, well, then, then you see Noah's day, and before Noah's mentioned in Genesis chapter 5, and Genesis chapter 6, what's going on is men beginning to just, you know, do all their process of doing that. Would it possibly be because they were trying to say, hey, Maybe some of our offspring can also too be 10 to 15 feet because 
That was the dominant popular, that was the dominant side of the Canaanite line. The Seth line was not as tall as that. They weren't that tall. People in the Bible we see that are godly men, uh, like King Saul. You can get seven foot maybe, you know. Seven foot, I mean, I'd go up to maybe eight, but maybe. But you're talking you're talking a good two feet shorter than the shortest of the giants. And half the size of the tallest of the giants of King's line, because they were all second gen. He's the first gen, right? So then all of a sudden the angels come in, so the men were doing what they were doing, probably trying to, by the attrition of possibilities, maybe somehow get the silly straw of some lineage of Cain that they, you know, some lineage of Seth, maybe mixing those two together, you might get the in-between size of a 10 to 12 foot, maybe instead of, you know, seven or eight, maybe or six to eight, maybe. maybe. I don't know what they're thinking, but I one thing they're looking at pleasure, desires, fulfilling what they wanted, lust of the flesh, that's what they were doing. And maybe the back of their mind was that agenda as well. Trying to, you know, kind of usurp against the, the different infighting it might have been and the tribal the tribalism that was going on, you imagine, in early days. Humans don't change. We all want a little tribal space of our, our and you don't you don't have the same, you know, foothold if your adversaries are obviously larger than you. So it makes sense. You're trying to maybe, you know, propagate to just maybe by attrition, maybe mix in some of your stronger warriors too, maybe to go against them, who knows? But the angels see this going on, maybe their idea was, hey, we'll bring back the whole first gen again. We'll bring back first gen giants. So they come in, they start taking, they didn't, they didn't have women consult with them. They raped them. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 6, verse 2, and it says, And the daughters of men, the daughters were born unto them, and the sons of God, verse 2, saw the daughters of men, and they were fair, which means they were very uh, intensely, like, la. So they saw them. And so they said, well, I'm going to take them. That means they ongoingly took them by force of all they chose, what they preferred. So as guys today say, well, I'm this kind of, I like this about a woman. I like this about a woman. They chose whatever they liked about a woman. I don't know what that was, whether it's their hair color, their size, their shape, whatever it was, they just took them. I got this one. I'm going I'm to lay with this one, see what comes out of this. See what offspring comes out of this one, and this one, and this one. And hence, that's why you have the nephilim, the rephium, the anicums, the zimzums, right? <laughs> right? The zamzums, all the different kinds of giants that we have in the land of Canaan come from these different variations of women they slept with. Because that was our whole goal, to create just like, where they get that from? Because they saw, again, men cross, crossing over, men with men, women with women. They saw men switching out partners, women switching out partners. They saw them all sitting with animals. Saw them even more later on. And they said, God said in Genesis 6, they were already doing that then. So they did that too with the animals. Hence, you got these Greek mythology things of centaurs and minotaurs and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, there was hybrid humans and hybrid animals going on. It's not cool, like, at all. And that's why God flooded the earth. It was a disgusting display of a baptization of God's restoration. Mankind was supposed to be of a gene pool of mankind. Now it became perverted. They weren't monogamous. They were hybrids. Animals were supposed to be after their own kind. And now they're after some other damnation kind. What the heck is this? What, what, what unholy hell is this? And God's like, no, this is ridiculous. And, not, and you add to that, they're killing each other. Men are killing men. Men are killing animals. Animals are killing animals. And God's like, this is insane. That's, that's what's going on. That's what's going on. Genesis, you ask me the question, what's going on? Genesis 1, 6, 1, and 2. That's what's going on. Not a good thing. It was a very freaky earth, by the way. It's a very freaky earth, if you ask me. That ain't cool at all. Oh, by the way, you think that's fun? No, I don't think so. You know what's more eerie about that? That days of no. Hello. That's going to be as it is. It begins, the days of no begins during the last half of tribulation when the demons are running amok and they're going to do it all over again. Taking women as they wish and animals. And they're going to have hybrids going on trying to exist just like they were off the Noah's Ark. They're going to try to exist post flood, post tribulation, they're going to try to exist in lineal reign, and they're going to be taken out. That's what Jesus said, and they perusia on the presence of the Son of Man, so shall it be in the same way as it was this, of, of Noah's day, days of Noah, as the same as the perusia, the presence of the Son of Man. What are we talking about? I looked going on in Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. But maybe I didn't say it that way before to help you remember better, but boy, I tell you, it, it, it's weird. Very weird. Very, very weird. 
So, with that in mind, keep that in mind. Then you go to Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Then this is the your question is, wait a minute, what's this verse 3 about? When God says, uh, the Lord said, my spirit will not always strive with man. Now the word strive means to, I will not continue to allow myself to be despised, to be discarded, to be judged. That's what this word means. It doesn't mean strive as in, I'm agonizing with you. No, I am not going to allow myself to sit back and watch the intention of what I made humans for and animals for and angels for get bastardized at every level. I'm not going to sit back and take it. Enough. I'm going to wipe all of you off. I'm going to save a few. I'm going to save a few. But I am so detested by your disgusting display of your inability to do what I ask you to do. He's showing us at every level, angelic, human, animal, we all collectively suck at following the rules. We can't do right. We just are pathetic. We can't do what's right. We're left to our own devices. Pleasure, lust of the flesh, desires of life. That's what we do. That's what we're good at. We're best at that. And God goes, don't act like you're any different humans today. If I left you to your own devices for hundreds of years, you do the same thing. You do the same thing. Especially when you've got a second generation, hybrid generation going on from Cain's line, continuing to, to propagate their ever-present among you, again reminding you that you're, you're second fiddle of the human race because you are the pure human race going against this hybrid human race that's like way advanced with iron. And that's way before the Hittites introduced iron in 1600. They're introducing it a good 3,000 years earlier. That ain't cool at all. You want to get in competition with these people. They're probably murdering them at will. They're probably just getting what they want at will. This is my land, my crop. This is my this, this is my that. You can imagine why they were probably, again, not at peace with each other. I could see that. The Canaanite line was growing. And by for at force, they had, they, again, they were workers of iron, artificers of iron. They knew, they knew how to be warriors. They were mighty men, God says. Men of renown. Same thing instead of Nimrod, later on. He's a mighty man, which means warrior, strength, per person of strength, a mighty, valorous person of skilled hunting. They're not like slouches, they're not like dumb brutes. <gasps> I, I have fire, I have a club. <laughs> no, they were strong and, and they were skilled. They weren't stupid, they weren't brutes. They were strong and smart. That's not a good combination coming come against when you're not as tall or strong or smart. Good luck with that. You can see maybe why they propagate went just because it desires the flesh and lost the lie, maybe because also there's safety in numbers. We might get lucky and get a hybrid offspring somewhere to get a taller you know, offspring, but we also, if we don't get that, the, the second case is quantity is going to help us over offset this quality of the opponent against us. So it's probably the Sephite line. Say Noah, save Noah, who's the only one that got found righteous, right? Yikes. So with that being said, then you go on to say, in verse 3 of Genesis 6, he says, I will strive with man for an erring that he also is that, that, what, that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, this phrasing is not in the actual uh, King James in some ways. It, it, it leaves out this phrasing, an erring. And this word, an erring, it is in the actual text. And, and this wording, it's, it's in there, but you don't see it in, in your part. And so when you, when you don't see that in your actual King James, you, you miss it. But in erring, it means to be easily deceived inadvertently. It means that from our ignorance, from our inability to have the intellectual capacity to discern good from evil and to see a lie coming from afar, to not understand that our feelings can't be trusted, that our thoughts aren't to be relied upon, go by what God says. So I'm trying to reason things out and act like you're so brilliant. We're just too, we're inadvertently, either we don't care or we, don't, or we try to do the right thing and we're trying to figure out what the right thing is Instead of just doing what God says, God says, you don't understand whether you're, in it, whether you're rebelliously against me or whether you're trying to do what's right. You're too ignorant. You're too unknowing to try to figure it out on your own. You're going to inadvertently, ignorantly engage yourself in sin. Allah, no. After the ark, he gets off the ark, plants a vineyard, and he takes up the grapes, which he doesn't know if he it now because the sun rays are now beating down through. 
And now that for a minute he gets drunk. It was unintentional. It was an ignorant thing. It was inadvertent. He was trying to do what was right by having fruit of the vine, but he did that which is wrong and inadvertently, ignorantly, not realizing the landscape of the shape of the earth and the and landscape of how the earth seasons were all different now. He didn't understand that. How could he? This goes back to your question, Sister Vicki, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Don't forget, earlier in Genesis chapter 5, Noah was 500 years old. Genesis 5, verse 32. He was 600 years old, Genesis 7, 6, when he went onto the ark. It was not 120 years to build the ark. It was 100 years. So why does God say 120? This goes back to our study we did over three years ago, back in May of 2019. You can look it up online under the studies tab, under the sermons tab. It's on Noah's Ark. But it goes all the way back then. That's how far ago we talked about this. It's been three years. And believe me, I too forget stuff. So I can tell you right now that the 120 years speaks to the 100 years from which God called Noah and he built the ark for the 100 years. 100 years to represent the 100 fruit yield that Noah represents as a soon medical person. That would be a delayed yield fruit, which is coming from those who are given a quick resurgence into their maturity in Christ of the mysteries and secrets. We see that. We see that these soon medical people in the second half of tribulation are amongst many spoiled people who are in the position to be disinherited, his family. But he then, like a medical portion does in tribulation, is helping them to gain access to that inheritance, as a medical portion does in tribulation in the future. The hundred years speaks to that hundred fruit yield that is necessary to bear forth to be part of the collective faithful ones later on, as they become later on a type of that which is preserved through tribulation through a trial. And on the other side, they get baptized through fire, if you will, literally. Uh, and that trial on the earth of tribulation to come, the type of Noah. But the other 20 years, is because after they got the ark, and you go to Genesis in chapter 9, Noah began to plant a vineyard. In Genesis 9 and verse 20, he began to be a husbandman and plant a vineyard. That was 20 years had gone by. Those are 20 years. They got off the ark. It's now 20 years later. He's now planting vineyards, and then he gets drunk. So God's talking about that event that happened in Genesis chapter 9, verse 20. The 100 years of the flood plus 20 years post-flood, together 120 years, and that's when my spirit will no longer stand for being despised. Meaning, I was utterly baptized in what I expected of the angelic host, human beings, and of the animal kingdom. I destroyed everything and saved a couple of human beings and some species of every animal. Then, which, by the way, on the ark were dinosaurs and dragons. You go, that's dumb. No, you're dumb if you think it's dumb. Read the book of Job. He was after Noah's flood. You can't be mentioning dragons and dinosaurs and Job understand what they are unless, guess what? They were on the ark because they were alive. And Job knew what they were. Wake up, people. The behemoth with the tail of the cedar tree. They ain't no elephant. Hello. The dragon, fire from its nostrils, and smoke, and flames, and, and the scale of iron on its chest, lies in the sea, and wings. That is a dragon. Hello. But no commentary. Go, this is all folklore. No, it's not. No, it's not. We know they're on the ark. How do we know? Because they're in the book of Job, which is a contemporary of Abraham, which is post noatic so Those who think that science always lies to you, and therefore everything about science is a lie, don't fall for that lie that because liars lie doesn't mean they don't use truth. Remember, Satan always, always uses truth when he tells a lie. He always has and he always will because he's very well versed in the truth. Doesn't mean he's telling the truth. It means he's lying by using the truth in a different narrative with a stuffed in lie. So be careful. Just because you see truth in something doesn't mean it's true. Well, how can this be this and this? this but that's all to be true. It doesn't mean that. Vet it all out, my friends. Come on. Satan used scripture to the T with the God, God the Son himself, Yeshua. 
to the T. He didn't twist it at all. He heard it perfectly. He, he, he misappropriated it. Now with E, he left out Yahweh. He is Elohim. There, he used different tactics. He left out. What the heck, man? I'm telling you, he is a slick willy. You can't just sit there and ignorantly think because truth is being heard or seen, therefore everything else that goes along with it must be true. No, no, no. This is what he's doing right now in our culture, I'm telling you. He is, he is targeting us. He's targeting us. He knows that we're susceptible to know there's lies everywhere you look, from the pulpits to everywhere else. And so he knows that you're susceptible to want to look for truth, and therefore he's going to give you truth, but stuff some lies in there. Be alert, people. Come on, man. Come on. I don't care how much truth you read, that everything you read, everything you see, everything you hear, to think, wait a second, where is that based in Scripture? To understand that, and, and understand, he's a, he's a, <laughs> so the hundred years, again, is the time he called Noah to the ark being finished. We saw that in Genesis 5, 32. Genesis 7, 6, he was 500. Then he was 600 on the ark, 100 years. So it was not 120 to build the ark, it was 100. Whereas other 20 years came in that God said, what he means is, my spirit wasn't going to be despised anymore, so I destroyed all these I mentioned, angelic and human and animal. And then he was still striving with Noah, who we called righteous in Ezekiel 14, 14, with Job and Daniel. And yet, Noah inadvertently, ignorantly, not because he was a devil dog, because he was ignorantly and inadvertently not sticking to the plan of being a builder, and he gets involved with being a vineyard maker, a vineyard vine dresser. He's like, wait, wait, wait. He doesn't mean to go off the rails. He went off the rails a little bit. Inadvertently, as God says, they erred, which means they inadvertently were deceived by their ignorance. Not because you weren't living righteously, because you're ignorant. You don't understand. We don't have the wisdom to go against Satan and win. We don't have that wisdom. If he goes at us toe-to-toe, -to -toe, he's going to win every time. How do I know that? I eat Job. Hello. Ray Daisy did pretty good, but after that, he sucked it up pretty bad. So he was the best of us. He was God's champion. He didn't last eight days. After that, for every day after that, for five months plus, he was pathetic. 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 Not what the song said. He was great. He was great. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. And he knows it, too. He knows it, too. He cursed himself how he was acting. So the reality is no one was inadvertently, ignorantly. So God was saying, this is the last vestige of the righteous one, like I said, and that he has gotten drunk. And what's happened? His wife is now led with by his own son. That's it. My spirit is not going to stop. Here's my, here's my last one I called righteous of, of the ones I spared. His family was, was indirectly spared because of him. And what did he do? He caused another despising of the monogamous relationship of a marriage. He was therefore inadvertently drunk, which caused his son to take his own mother and his relations. Disgusting. And that's what God said. Well, no longer am I going to be despised anymore. That's it. He gave everybody destruction, save one man. He gave man 20 years post-flood to show that he's long-suffering and patient with us. And yet, we let him down in the person of Noah. Being righteous as he was, he was still too ignorant to know what right was, and he did the wrong thing. And that's why God said, my spirit went to strive with man. So you're correct, Sister Vicky, that the spirit speaks to the spirit of the maturity of, of the spirit of Christ in us. So the spirit restraining in, in Thessalonians 2, 7 is the spirit of Christ as in the mature ones of the 30, 60, 100 fruit. The restrainer is the spirit of Christ and the mature ones of 30, 60, 100 fruit. And when he's removed, that spirit of Christ is removed, that, that's the restrainer, the spirit of Christ. He's the restrainer. He's the restrainer. And so when he's removed, the Holy Spirit is still there in those two Medicoy people, but they don't have the Spirit of Christ anymore. The Spirit of Christ is gone. And that's what happened to the Noah spirit not driving with man. He represented the, like you mentioned, spirit and flesh dynamic of fleshly man's sin attitude toward doing which is 
just ignorantly wrong and the spirit of God dealing with the spirit of man is dealing with his spirit giving us the spirit of Christ to help us to be mature ones to act in righteousness to him as faithful people as Noah was and continued to be 20 years post flood but then he fell and then God said that's it I'm done that's it I'm done I'm done I'm no longer going to get the spirit of Christ and so Noah actually had a had a typology of the spirit of Christ in his life to show him living as he was living I'm not doing that anymore. Which was why it was very amazing for God to do what he did with Job. He didn't strive within him to make him a righteous man like he did with Noah. He put angel garrisons around him. Notice how it's different. Noah didn't have a garrison of angels around him, a hedge. Job did. Because that's God's way of transitioning from the statement he wouldn't strive with man, he didn't, in the maturity of man's spirit to help him be righteous and to walk with him as he was doing what. Nope. Once Noah did that, he despised God. And he, he just defiled the whole marriage. The whole the union of a marriage, a husband and wife, is depicting of the union with a man with his God, with his, with his creator. There's a solitude of faithfulness, of solidarity, of peace, of virginity, if you will, of keeping that chase, that relationship. And when that's fractured, he fractured that with his wife and his one flesh being fractured with his son lying with his wife because he was drunk. And so God said, that's it. I'm out. You fractured your human relationship, which is the depiction of our relationship. Therefore, our union is done. Which is why then, sir, secondly, I would not say Noah's wife was a hybrid or some kind of a, a deal weed. No. They're one flesh. Noah was righteous. Therefore, he could not be with a person who also, as you know, in the New Testament, uh, the righteous person sanctifies the unrighteous one. And so, therefore, I'm not going to chalk her up to any of that other stuff. It wasn't her. Remember, it was Naaman who married into Ham's line, the name of the line of Cain. They were about 300 years apart. That's how hybrid second generation angels, hybrid offsprings got post noatic flood. Because of Nema, she came from Cain's line. She was second gen. She was second gen hybrid. She married Ham. And Noah, they were the wheat and tares type, remember? You can't weed them apart. They're on the ark. Just as the wheat and tares will enter into the millennial kingdom and go through the whole thing. At the end, Matthew 13, he's going to weed them out. Matthew 13, 42 to 48, he's going to weed them out. Right? At the end of the harvest, at the end of the millennial reign. It's like at the end of the ark. Then Satan shows his ugly face and says, Ah, ha, ha. I have my second gen hybrid in name of seed, having offspring from Ham and Canaan, who gave forth to Cush and Nimrod, right? Nimrod was a second gen hybrid. He's about 10, 15 feet tall. Hope you understand that. So this is what's going on. So this is what's happening. I hope that answers your, your, your question about what was going on there and what the spirit means and the strainer means. And then you have the question about God's spirit in 120 years. I, I think I addressed that. Uh, and then again, uh, why is man being addressed? Because that, that word for I mentioned to be erring is the word shagag. I'll put it on the board later. It's S-H-A-G-A-G. -A -G, and it means to, again, through deception, through ignorance, to just go astray. Because we don't have the wherewithal, the capacity intellectually to come against evil and, and triumph. Not without the help of Almighty God. We, just, we can't do it. It's too strong. Then you mentioned, uh, was, Noah, uh, was this allowed time for Noah to build the ark? 100 years? Yes. Uh, 120 years of uh, passing. Uh, that would give the 100 years. But what you should, uh, you're close. Not, 100, not 120, but 100 years was yes, giving the time for the Seth line and the Canaanite line to continue to intermingle, like you mentioned. And they were all being polluted. That's correct. Um, the sentence were just blending together, just disgusting. And this is, and so by the delay, again, I mentioned that, to show the, the disparity of the, the fruition of the flesh and sin of disparity of how the desires lead to damnation and destruction, typified by the flood, and how Noah maintained righteousness through it all going on around him, typifying the sin medically, staying true to their mission in the lieu of a disgustingly dark, depraved, demonic, anxiety, stress-filled world. Noah pulled it off for a hundred years amidst who God, I can only imagine what he had to witness and see and still stay true and keep his family safe as well. He kept them, he kept them unstained. Even though they were not righteous on their own, they were made imputed righteous through him. Because he kept them safe. Remember, if you think that they were stained, 
then you're saying that he then was not righteous, and the reason that Ham was laying with Nema, that was the one uh, situation. He didn't, all his kids weren't living righteously, hence why Ham was with Nema, but once God calls him, he, he kept them. He kept them that way. He was 500, remember? So when God calls him. So I hope that helped answer your question, Sister Vicki, but you tell me, has answered your question satisfactorily? I'm not sure if I did or not. You tell me. I will also tell you, as you're answering, Nema is mentioned in Joshua 15, that's verses uh, 20 to 41. She's a city, it's a city in Canaan. And that's not a coincidence. Land of the giants. And it was given, and that city of Nama, which is the lineage of Cain's line, was given to the tribe of Judah, the tribe of kings. <laughs> what a coincidence. So the tribe of kings triumphed over as their inheritance, their land, which was the city of Nama in Canaan. That's not coincidental at all. Yes? Vicki said, that was so much more than I expected. Thanks. Well, you got it. Then we got Sister uh, Pam's question, which is like, not question questions. It's insanely long. But the general idea, as it flows into this same thought, is based on Genesis 25. So first I want to say Sister Pam's question is very, um, like Vicki's question, it goes, they go in line together. It's very insightful. It goes together. So go to Genesis 25. And you will see um, verses uh, 20, uh, chapter 25, verses 20, uh, let me see, 26 uh, through 34. It says, and after that came his brother out and took his hand of uh, Esau's, and, named, and his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was, six, was three score and 60, and son of 60 years old, when she bare them. The boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter. Understand what this means. Esau was skilled and knowledgeable. He was man's man. And the word hunter means he hunted game. So I want to say this in advance. The things that Pam brings forth that are in some ways referencing the book of Joshua, which is mentioned in the Bible and the book of Joshua, I understand that. However, the book of Joshua, as we all know, and Pam just Pam knows this too, is not part of the biblical record of God inspired. However, like the book of Enoch and the book of Joshua have information pieces that are enlightening and, and, and enticing to entertain what may have happened. However, doesn't mean their details are correct. However, I like to see the general idea of what they're saying is based on something of truth, but the specifics I don't go along with because if they were meant to be, they'd be in the scripture. That's how I see those books. So I love the added flavor they can add to, but I don't like the specifics unless it's in the scripture then I like the specifics. Other than that, I take their offerings as the general ideas, but knowing the details may be off. And I'm about to show you how the details are off, but I'm gonna prove it, not by just saying, thus say it the Lord of the Scripture, because that's all that matters, the book of God doesn't matter. No, no, I'm gonna show you by what God says in the Scripture specifically, meaning the timeline will default to the real answer. The timeline is the key. Just doing the math. So the question that Sister Pam asks is, is Nimrod the person that Esau could have encountered when he was out hunting and he came back famished and said, look, I'm famished, I'm weak, I'm weary, I'm languished, I'm thirsty, I'm, I'm, I'm hungry. He, he meant, he, languished means I'm so thirsty, I'm parched, and I'm so hungry, I'm weak. And I mean like when I get off the treadmill at the gym, when I get off the treadmill, I go do the weights and I go to the stairmaster. I'm in there for two and a half hours. And I can't tell you, I'm not, I'm not trying to brag about this, I'm not. I'm just giving you an example. This is a small similitude. That's just for two and a half hours. And that breaks in between. I'm not in the, in the heat of the sun with no AC, having bears and lions and tigers and all kinds of other dinosaurs and dragons around me like Esau did. Not to mention, Esau also had other second gen giants in the land out there hunting because they also were mighty men. Genesis 10, 8, and 9, Nimrod was a mighty man and also called a hunter. 
a hunter, a skilled one at that. So Esau, not being a hybrid, Nimrod was dead. He could not have been. How do I know that? The Nevada Flood, 3374. Abraham, 2076, he was called. After Abraham came Isaac, after Isaac came Jacob and Esau. You got over a thousand years. Even if you put, because Noah was 600 years when the flood took place. And he was 950 when he, when he died. So if I subtract 350 from 3374, I still get 3,000 and change. If I subtract 3,000 and change from 2,100 and change, that means that, hello, or excuse me, 1,900 and change, then you're looking at over 1,000 years old, and God said, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. No human, a pure human race or a hybrid, none will live over 1,000 years. Ain't happening, because sin will kill you. And the day you eat thereof, you shall die. No one who's a human, purebred, or hybrid, none live more than, they don't live a thousand years. They live under 900 and change, the best you can get. You ain't getting into a thousand, guys. Ain't gonna happen. Because God says. So therefore, doing the math, and then what had to be born at least, at least, when Noah died, which you know was before that, right? So we're looking at 3,000 and change he was born, B.C. Abram was 75 years old in 2076. That's a thousand years later. And Esau is a good 100 years after that. How are you going to tell me that <laughs> there's no way, man? There's no way. Sorry. No way. There is no way that Nimrod was alive. Because if he was, he'd be a thousand plus years old. And that goes against what God said. The day you eat there, you shall die. And that means you can't live to a thousand years old. Therefore, you're done. However, however, I think the book of Joshua is on to something there. Because this is my point. I don't want to. It's not totally wrong, but the concept is correct. Because you talk about Esau being skilled and knowledgeable as a hunter. Understand what that means. He is not dumb at all. Not a brute. He's pretty good size. I'm probably imagining he's a, on the higher end of the normalcy of humans. Probably seven foot or something. Big, burly guy. And just to ask the question, was he probably some, uh, did he have some kind of deficiency where he was hairy? I don't know if he had some kind of deficiency of being hairy, but I know this. He, he definitively had a, had a more testosterone that makes him more of a brute, but he also had an intellectual mind to him, which, think about this. If he's out hunting and he always brought back game for Isaac to eat, that's what it says. Book of Genesis, read it. Verse 27. Esau was a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man, going in tents. Verse 28, Genesis 25. Verse 28, Isaac and loved Esau because he, he did eat of his venison of the hunt. So Rebecca loved Jacob. So Isaac loved Esau because Esau would come and bring home the food. Bring home the bacon, dun, 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 right? Fried up on a pan. Because he always knew he is the man. <laughs> but Esau comes back from the hunt and he's famished, parched, th thirsty, hungry, so weak at the knees. The point about the gym story earlier is when I'm done with that treadmill at the very end, I am sitting down for five minutes to catch my breath. I have an oxygen thing, go do it twice. People walk by time to time and say, are you all right? Are you okay? Are you all right? And that's just doing a stupid treadmill. That's, that's just a Stairmaster. Okay, so I do 2,550 steps in a half an hour. What do you do? That's a lot, I, it's a lot. But I don't, I, don't, I, I don't lean over, I stand up when I do it. But it wins me. And I'm sweating like I got out of a pool. I'm soaking wet. But that is nothing compared to what Esau's talking about. Because when you're parched and you're hungry and you're out of breath, you feel like you're going to die. I do feel that way. But more importantly, why would he say that? Is it just because he was famished? Is it just because he was hungry? Just because he had a, had a full day hunting? You know what else it means? He put forth a lot of exerted energy. That means he probably ran pretty fast. He had a lot of engagement and fighting against trying to get home the hunt. And he came home unsuccessful. So how does a skillful, knowledgeable, strong hunter come home without anything in hand and say he's parched, he's hungry, and he's about to fall over dead, he's so tired? 
How does that happen? Unless, guess what? The enemy of his pra the prey he was seeking wore him out. It was too great for him that day. Hello! He was probably fighting some kind of dinosaur, some kind of dragon, and or maybe even likely hybrid second gen giants that got the better. They were probably in the same place hunting. And he's like, oh crap, now I gotta fight the, the beast and the second gen hybrid? I, I'm just lucky guy here for my life. That's probably what happened. I don't know. I think the book of Jasher talking about him fighting Nimrod is similar, it has the right similitude of idea that he was engaged in a in an adversarial fight that 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 spent him. That exhausted him mentally, physically, and it made him parched, made him hungry, made him weak. I feel like he's about to die. I can feel that way out of breath just doing the gym. I can imagine he's feeling with the who knows hours he was out there trying to stave off the beasts, plural, along with the second gen hybrids. That would exhaust me. Especially when I have, I got, I got nothing to show for. I'm kind of ticked off. I'm frustrated. I'm famished. I'm frustrated. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to be alive. I, I survived the hunt this day, but I got out with my skin and my teeth. So I don't think he fought Nimrod. I don't think he defeated Nimrod. I think Nimrod was already dead, but he's fighting the similitude of a person like Nimrod. Because Nimrod was nothing more than a second gen giant. Although he was a leader of the giants in the Tower of Babel. We find with this occurrence, I think Esau encountered not just one, but many, I think, mighty men, <laughs> along with other beasts like dinosaurs and dragons, that were like, whoa! It just, it just, it, it spent him trying to fend for his life, trying to flee for his life, trying to just get out of there alive. Because this was a hunt that he wasn't going to win. It was about survival at this point. The prey became the predator. The predator, I should say, became the prey. He was the predator, as he always is. And that day, he became the prey. And he was like, oh my gosh, not cool, like at all. Don't forget, dinosaurs were alive. Dragons were alive. And so were second gen hybrids. So when he comes in from the hunt, skilled, knowledgeable, and strong, empty-handed, how do you want to tell me he didn't come against an adversary that was actually stronger than him, and his, he being the predator became the prey that day? That's why you can explain his mental condition, his physical condition, and the fact he's empty-handed. Because the predator wasn't the predator that day. He was the prey. He was trying all he could to stay alive. And so when he came home to Jacob, Jacob took advantage of that situation. Instead of going, man, bro, you must have got your butt kicked handed. You must have handed it to you today. You must have had a tough day out there today. No, took advantage of him. Typical Jacob, man, Mr. Deceiver. Took advantage of him. And he sold him the, the, the porridge for his birthright. So that's what happened. And by the way, when Esau ate the porridge, it says that he was, he ate and drank in verse 34 because he was hungry and thirsty. That's what language means. I'm weary. I'm spent. And again, in the gym, I'm a spent. I can't like catch my breath. I'm sweating. I'm, and that's just for a, a snippet. I'm not out in the hot sun for hours. I'm not being hunted. My life's not being threatened. I'm doing that to myself. I can only imagine People doing that unto me by me trying to just fear for my life. The whole fight or flight kicks in. The heart rate's up a lot higher. The stress and anxiety's through the roof. You got huge beasts coming at you and second gen giants you're going against. How he even lives is, is remarkable because of his skill and knowledge and strength. That's why he survived. And not to mention, more importantly, God's provision to keep him alive. He was called Edom, by the way. It says in verse 30. For I am faint, he said, therefore his name was called Edom. But Edom means stuffed. Because all he cared about was getting stuffed. And it shows you that in the spiritual warfare fight, that we fight not against flesh and blood, but powers of darkness and principalities and authorities. That's what these dinosaurs, dragons, and second gen hybrids represent. And the typology is that don't give in to the fight when you're languished and weary and give up on God's promises for the temporary satisfaction of your physical emotional, mental needs. Don't do that. As much as it makes sense, as much as you may want to do it, don't. That is a typology of Esau. It's not about him cutting off Nimrod's head and all that stuff, like Jasher talks about. It's about that whole battle he was up against, a battle he was never going to win. But use the skill and knowledge and strength that God did give you to just survive. And when you survive, 
know it's going to take everything from you to survive. And know that when you're at that state, going back to the work and person of Satan, know he's going to use your compromised state to come at you as Satan to deceive you, because he's using the timing of the events at your high and at your low to come at you. And that's what he did with Esau. And Esau got stuffed with the worldly satisfactions and pleasures, in this case, of his food and water to drink. You can't argue that's not necessary. Those are necessary things. But God's pointing out a more important necessary thing. That's a spiritual blessing. He should never have given up, even though that is a highly, highly needed physical necessity. He should have given up something else, not that. That was the message in that story. But Sister Pam has a great point. And why did he come back the way he did? It wasn't just a regular hunt. I hope that's just a question, that it wasn't a regular hunt. I agree. I don't think it's Nimrod, though. I think it's people like Nimrod. Nimrod was, again, a second-gen giant, about 10, 15 feet, but he was already dead. But it was not just him, but others like him of the same size, of the same strength, of the same might, of the same hunting skill, and that's he's going against. hope that makes sense. I can't be Nimrod because he'd be over 1,000 years old, and that doesn't fly. So then, the other question that Sister Pam asked, she says, well, wait a minute. What was this? So if he was expecting, um, was he expecting, you said Nimrod, I'm just going to use that and replace that with other second-gen hybrids coming after him. Was he expecting second-gen hybrids to come after him to kill him and therefore make his birthright insignificant? I don't think he was expecting that so much as he was just expecting the fact that he escaped by the skin of his life, by the skin of his teeth, and he knows he should have been dead. And what he should have been doing is thanking God for providing him safe passage back home again. But instead, again, it's physical needs outweighed the spiritual reflections and he gave in to the desires of the flesh. That was the story there. He wasn't saying the book or this is significant because they're going to come hunt me down. He was saying God was using him to show us that that's the nature of his, his, his beast. Literally, no pun intended. That was the nature of his battle in his life. He gave in to the needs and desires of the flesh. In lieu of the fact God gave him enough reflection spiritually to draw from that he should have overcome that and realized he's alive because of the hand of God. There's no way on his own he could have done that. But yet he gave in. That's what I, That's why that's significant. Yes? Okay, Vicki said, <clears throat> you were saying that the game that Esau brought home wasn't on the same days as when he returned weary. Being weary was because of fighting second generation giants and Jacob had the stew made and was prepared for this condition in Esau. Esau sold his firstborn birthright, but not his everlasting covenant with God. Correct. He sold his birthright, but and what what Esau was languished from was that he was out in the field. He'd come back and bring home, you know, venison, deer. And this time, obviously, he was that shows where he's hunting. He's hunting more typical game that a man can take down of his skillful knowledge, strength. But he goes against now, all of a sudden he comes across not just second gen giants, he comes across dinosaurs and dragons, potentially. I don't know why. I think it's a combination of all three. The fact that he was that beat up, that languished, I think it's a combination of all three. It was it was the hybrid second gen giants he's against, multiple, along with, he, they were probably, he probably stumbled across their little soiree of their hunting ground. He probably found, he probably went, went to an area where he was, you know, my hunters like to do this, like to just expand their horizons. He wanted to come out to bigger game, and he sees dinosaurs and, and dragons. Say, I can take them down, I can try my hand at this, because hunters who are good at what they do always want to expand their horizons. How good can they be? And all of a sudden, he, he stumbles into, oh, goodness gracious. This is the giant's land where they hunt. They're hunting the dinosaurs and the dragons, and now I'm trying to take on a new, a new, a new challenge, and now I realize I'm taking on two challenges now. I'm taking on a new adversarial prey, but now they've taken on another hunter who's actually more skilled and knowledgeable than me. Yikes. And they're stronger than me. And i got to fend off both. That's what I think happened. That's why I think he's so spent. It wasn't just one. I think it's the combination of both. He stumbled onto an area where he was venturing out and, and he wanted to bring home. That's why he came empty handed. And Jacob, yes, took advantage of that. Absolutely he did. That's what he always does. He's a deceiver. Like to take advantage of things. But he typifies what Satan does. And a compromised state comes at you as satanists to deceive you, and that's what Jacob did to Esau. Yes? Vicki said Jacob knew this and used it to take birthright. 
Yeah. Not nice. No, he's not nice. So that's why that's why later on it makes more sense now. When people like to just chalk up Esau as being some dillweed, and you realize later on that he's the one who tugs on Esau's neck. He's the one that Jacob said, I've seen your face, seen the face of God. Esau's the one that God said, I blessed him and Edom. Now you see why. But Edom is a, is a, is a constant slap in the face that Esau's uh, sin of consequence, which was he was supposed to stuff himself with God's spiritual, uh, you know, restoration, God's spiritual refreshment, God's spiritual water of his word and the, the bread of his life. But instead, he stuffed himself with the physical bread of life and the physical water that parched his mouth. But you can't fault him because unless you've been in that state, unless you've been there, let me tell you something. That's like you, if you, if you, come, you come to me after the stairmaster and I'm in that situation, and I'm not joking, I, I'm like, and I go, with an oxygen thing, and I'm sweating, I'm profusely I'm telling you, I'm soaking wet like I came out of the pool, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm hardly breathing and for five minutes. Okay, and if you told me then, hey, don't know about the oxygen and the water, I, I'd be like, you need to show up. Because I need both of those at that point, right? So I, I can only imagine how he must have felt. He wants food bad. He needs he needs water bad. He needs he needs to have a breather. He needs some refreshment. And so he he he. he he devalued and deprioritized the spiritual refreshment you should have and eat first. And we all do that when we're in a compromised physical, emotional, mental state. That is the point of Satanus. Remember, I told you that in the first work of Satan. That's his rhythm method he uses. It's about timing and, and how the, right, he, he knows the ebb and flow of our highs and lows and comes at us. That's what Jacob was used to show how we use, Satan used him to come after Esau. And that's why you got stuck with the wrong thing. Yes. And Laney said, is this a similar type of how in Christ people will succumb to the Antichrist and sell their place with the Lord to be in favor with the Antichrist to survive? Yep. That's exactly what I was going to say to you because uh, matched back to question number four of Pam, which she asked about what Christians willing to sell their birthright for a bowl of porridge. When the grocery stores are empty, like a type of Esau and people and the people in tribulation. See, sir, that's right. The mark of the beast is exactly what this is typifying of. It's exactly right. It's exact, Pam mentioned that. You just seconded it. I said it. You're correct. Esau is a clear, clear representation of those who want to act like, I would never, I would never. Until you've been like Esau, fighting with all you can, with all your strength, with all your might to stay alive, and you make it out alive. And now you need food and water and oxygen and just a place of repose. And someone says, I'll give you all you need, just, just take this mark. You're going to tell me you got the strength to say no? Stop lying to yourself. When you're already weak in your faith to begin with, you're already compromised. You're already compromised. What made Esau who he was, was hunting. He just got defeated. The one thing he's good at, he just got, he just got pumped. He just got showed that he is not who he thought he was. There's somebody else more skilled, more knowledgeable, stronger and a prey that's more adversarial. He got schooled that day, and it compromised him, it shattered him as a man. And he should have just, like tribulations, it's gonna shatter people, and they should turn to God in those situations, but instead, they're gonna be human and sinners, and turn to what their physical, mental, and again, physical, physical mental, and emotional needs gonna say, and that is, I need my, my water, my food, my shelter, my peace, and my repose. Sure, I'll take them on. What are they gonna do? Don't lie. Yes, you will. They will. You saw did because that's the type of what they're going to do. Yes. Okay. And Vicky said, I agree that Esau didn't fill himself with spiritual things, but what did Jake? But what Jacob did was tantamount to what those following Satan do. They are both disappointments. Lie, steal, deceive. And Yep, that's correct. And Vicki has, and then Sister Pam has another great question. Sister Pam asks what's about in the book of Revelation. We see that the Antichrist, when he is he's slain, um, he has a mortal head wound and he rises up again. So it's kind of like he has regenerative powers. Um, and the question is, is that isolated just to him? Or does that also encapsulate other giants, other hybrids? Do first gen or second gen hybrids likened unto Satan have this regenerative spirit of ability physically that when they get harmed, if they lose an arm, can it grow back? If they lose a finger, can it, if they get wounded, can it heal? That's a great, I don't know, that's a great insight to that. And that's the reason she, then Pam says, well, wait a minute, is that why Goliath's head had to be chopped off? 
because it had to be, he had to actually sever, you know, the, the head from the body to allow him to definitely be dead, or else he just regenerate. Um, it's hard to kill a giant. Um, there's some, <laughs> that's an interesting point, you know. The fact is that they are tougher to kill. Um, I don't know about their genitive issue, but I think it's an interesting thought. But one thing that's true about that principle is they're very tough to kill, and they have to be definitively when you kill them. And it is true that the Antichrist has a mortal head wound. That wasn't enough. He came back, and Goliath was stoned and not marked unconscious. That's not how he died. People think that's how he died. No, David took this sword, by the way, which was bigger than him, because Goliath's about 15 feet tall, and the sword's about half the size as you are. So if he's 15 feet, that sword's about 8 feet. David was not 8 foot tall. He's about, at most, he's about 6 foot. David took a sword 2 feet taller than him and wielded it, which means its weight was insane. It's at least 200 plus pounds he picked up. And all he picked up, wielded it enough to cut his neck off of his body. The strength and sheer ridiculousness of the size of a sword to be taller than him to take it and wield it and have the strength to, to dispose his head from his body is insane. Don't forget that. That's insane. What people saw was like, boo. And that's what they said. Saul killed his thousands. David killed his tens of thousands. Because what they're saying is, how could this boy, this six foot maximum, more than likely shorter than that, how could this kid with a sword two feet minimum, if not bigger than him, not only wield it, have the strength to dispose of it off of his head and cut his head from his body. Come on, man. If he can do that, he's killed tens of thousands. That's why they said that. You would do if you saw him do that. You'd be like, goodness gracious, if you could do that, what else can you do? Good. What do you tell me you haven't known about? He must have killed tens of thousands we haven't known about. Yes. Okay. And um, Lainey said, Oh, wait a minute. I read the one that said uh, Scary Thought Terminator, right? Yeah. Okay. Laney said Esau wandered away from his home and attempted to survive on his own, and it doesn't work. Home being the word and guidance from his parents. Yeah, I think that Esau um, tried to take his physical um, blessings God gave him intellectually and physically and use those to accomplish a 